Hey everybody, this is Dr. Maples. We're going to pick up our lecture series on cultural sociology. Right now we're talking about non-material culture. So we're going to add two more forms of non-material culture to the list. First one is norms and the second one is sanctions. Now norms are a little similar to values because they can overlap, remember. But norms talk about what is normal for a particular culture. What is a normal behavior? What is a normal action? Let's talk about something simple like um, kissing. So think about your cultural norms for a moment and think about when it would be normal for you to kiss another person. Think about lots of different scenarios like would you kiss a parent? Um, would you kiss a friend? Um, would you kiss um, a friend of the same sex as you? Would you kiss uh, a stranger? Would you kiss someone the first time that you meet them? Likewise, too, let's think about what would be considered normal for kissing someone. Uh, would it be like a kiss on the cheek? Would it be a kiss on both cheeks, which is kind of a traditional greeting in some countries? Would it be a kiss on the lips? Would it be a kiss on the forehead? These are all normal cultural things for many different cultures. Which one describes yours? I think back to my childhood, it wasn't really normal to kiss people, but we hugged everybody. Like, I still to this day, I'm perfectly comfortable hugging a total stranger. Um, I can meet someone and have a 10 minute conversation. I'd be like, hey, you know, bring it in, man. Let's, let's give a hug before we go. And that's okay. Some cultures don't feel that way. Likewise, the kissing thing was not something that was really part of my culture. We didn't kiss anybody. Even the idea of like kissing my parents was not like a thing that I did after age like five. And the idea of like kissing my father would be really strange. It would be almost unheard of. I think if I did that, he would have been like, what? <laughs> What's going on? So these are norms for my particular culture and your norms may be very different, but there's different kinds of norms. Like, um, how does your culture feel about picking your nose? And there's some cultures that's perfectly acceptable and it's perfectly normal. You can pick your nose in public and nobody cares. My culture would probably be more like I was taught to pick my nose in private if I had to at all. And um, uh, never pick your nose certainly in person uh, around other people in person. P p never pick your nose around other people. Um, but is that the same thing as maybe some of the other values like I have um, about maybe not kissing people, but it's okay to hug strangers um, or like maybe really important things like I should protect my family or that we shouldn't kill people. These are different kinds of normal ideas for my culture. My culture definitely says to me, you should not kill people unless they're a threat to your family. And then there's a weird connotation in it that like a gray area suddenly exists. Um, you shouldn't pick your nose in person uh, in, in front of other people. Um, but, you know, picking your nose is definitely not on the same page as like not killing people. You know, they're very different. In fact, the whole point we have here is that there are different kinds of non-material cultural norms in our culture. Some are super, super, super important, and others aren't really all that big of a deal. If you break them, it's not the end of the world. These are important. I want to talk about them for the moment. Now, the really important ideas, the most cherished ideas, are things that we call mores. Now, time out. I want to point out that word. It's spelled M-O-R-E-S, right? That's pronounced mores. How? I don't know, because if you put an S in front of it, it's s'mores. I don't know, but then again, I'm a Girl Scout dad, and maybe that's part of it. Nonetheless, it's pronounced mores. Even though it looks like mores, it's mores. Mores are the most cherished values of a particular culture. Some of the things are like um, lines that you cannot cross. Like, um, you cannot hurt your family. Um, as a father, I have to protect my family. That's just part of what I was taught as a culture. Um, there's also lots of mores that are important things like we don't desecrate dead bodies. Um, we take care of American flags. I'll talk about that in a moment. These are some of the most cherished values of my cultural background and their norms. These are things that I just wouldn't imagine crossing those lines. You're not going to see a scenario in which I'm going to desecrate a, a, a American flag. It's just not going to happen. Those are really cherished things to me. Are they the same as not picking my nose in public? Not at all. In fact, these less important things like picking your nose, walking on the right side of the street, walking on the right side of the hallway, these are actually what we call folkways. They're not all that important. Now, you might kind of um, make people mad if you don't follow them. So like um, a folkway for my culture would be like, you probably should be nice 
um, when you go to family reunions. So you kind of smile at everybody, you know, and if you didn't, it's actually pretty normal. Um, but you kind of violated a folk way because you're spo supposed to be nice to everybody. You're supposed to pretend like you care what your cousins are up to, even when you don't. Actually, I do. I have some really cool cousins, but anyways. Um, mores are our most cherished values. Folkways are the less important things. Now, it's exciting, and you may be thinking about this, is that mores you'll often see get attached to laws. In fact, there are laws saying how we protect the American flag. There are laws saying we don't desecrate dead bodies. Um, there's even like laws that specific, specify all sorts of things about sexual norms, um, about um, scenarios you can and can't have sex with people, such as protecting children, which is very important. That would be mores. These are the most cherished values. We protect our children. And then there's laws that even protect less things, like, you know, don't jaywalk. And you really shouldn't, because you might get hit by a car, and then it would just be bad. Um, but, you know, if you do that, it's not necessarily the same as desecrating a dead body or stepping on an American flag. So we can see how these things are different. Mores, again, are most cherished values, or you can even help to remember our more cherished values. Mores, more, you see that? That helps me remember it. And folkways are the less important things that all the folks kind of do from time to time, because everybody picks their nose in their car on the drive home, and you get seen, and it's embarrassing. The same as you're singing in your car, and you get seen. It's a folkway. It's not a big deal. Let's talk about some more examples of these, though. Let's talk about some of the really important things maybe in mainstream American culture that we might define as mores. So, for example, how might we treat an American flag? Now, this is very important to me. I come from a military family. I'm also an Eagle Scout, Girl Scout dad, as I've mentioned. And the American flag is a very important idea to me. It's something that I take it very seriously when I see people uh, disrespecting it. Um, if you weren't aware, some of the ways that we disrespect American flags are making them into clothing. That, by the way, if you don't know how to take care of an American flag and you don't know how to fold it, I've included a link on my PowerPoint. If you're an American, I strongly encourage you to learn about the American flag. Learn how to be able to properly fold an American flag. Likewise, if you ever become in the possession of a soiled American flag, that's one that is damaged to the point that it should not be flown. That could be ragged edges. That could be a stain that can't be washed out. There are ways of getting rid of those um, in a respectful way. In fact, one of the things that you can do is often go to your city town hall and ask about um, any uh, flag destruction programs that they have on hand, and they will take your flag and have one of the local troops or a local military guard um, retire the flag appropriately, which, interestingly enough, is to burn it, but in a ceremonial way. Uh, my Boy Scout troop, uh, when I was a kid, that was kind of one of the things that we did to serve the public, was if there was a flag that had to be retired, we might be called on to lead that ceremony. Um, it's kind of interesting, though, and the flip side of that is just flat out burning a flag would be disrespectful, but to do it with ceremony and in the correct situations, it's actually the appropriate thing to do to retire an old flag. But what if it was, um, I don't know, like a football team and it was their flag like um i don't know let's pretend that the uh, university of tennessee skyhawks um happened to roll into town from martin tennessee and they're playing eku football and uh, the skyhawks leave some of their flags on the ground do we care let's pretend that they have those little annoying flags that you put in your car window the little small ones that you find on the interstate from time to time if you see a ut martin oh heck if you see an eku colonel's a um, little football flag or um, just even our logo flag that's flown off on the edge of the interstate. Are you going to pull over and pick that up and take it to the city hall and retire it? No. Why? Well, it's not the same. An American flag is something that we treat as our most cherished values. That's mores. Sports flags, those are folkways. In fact, if that kind of flag fell off, I would feel okay throwing it in the trash. An American flag, no, you have to retire that. And frankly, it's kind of iffy even if flying those in the sense that they might still fly off is even a good idea. Um, but nonetheless, a sports team flag gets a very different thing. What about flags from other countries? How do you feel about destroying the flag of another country? Maybe you got a thing against Canada who makes awesome maple syrup and they have my last name on their flags but maybe you have some kind of problem with them how would you feel about destroying a canadian flag that's kind of a borderline in fact i would say that i would respect their country's mores in the same way that i would respect mine i would want to treat a canadian flag with respect that i, I would treat any flag with respect that's not a sports team flag what about state flags 
see there we're kind of getting into some other weird realms um you know it's something to think about but these are examples of mores and folkways and actions which of the things would be mores well our most cherished ones are always going to be our american flag but at the same time maybe we also respect the uh, mores of another culture like canada's support for their flag and maybe we would hope that they would respect our flag as well but if you lose the ut martin skyhawk flag on the side of the road I'm just going to throw that one in the trash. And I used to work for them. It's nothing against them, but it's just we don't treat those flags with the same respect. That's the difference between mores, most cherished values, and folkways, things that if you violate those norms, it's not really that big of a deal. But what happens when you violate those norms? That's what we need to talk about. In fact, that's our last version of non-material culture, something we call the sanction. Now, my criminal justice majors, you're going to be interested in this one because this is all about you. Sanctions are what happen when somebody gets out of line, when we break a communication uh, value, a norm, something like that. When we do things wrong, a sanction is how our culture pulls us back in line. Now let's think about this from a moment when you were a kid, maybe you had a mom or a grandpa or a family member who when you got out of line, they gave you that side eye. And you know what I'm talking about, like I'm, I'm kind of like shaking a little bit just thinking about my grandmother doing that right now. She was a woman a few words, but when she turned her head sideways and her eyes went down a little bit, yeah, you, you were in trouble. You better be <laughs> paying attention because things are about to go bad if you say the wrong things or if you don't stop. This is a good example of a sanction. In fact, that's what we would call an informal sanction, but I'll explain that in a moment. Sanctions are what happen when we get out of line, we get pulled back in. You get the side eye and you know you better just kind of chill out whatever you're doing. When a parent walks in, they say, hey, no, no, no. And you just say, oh, yeah, I won't do that. Kind of went back into my home accent there for a moment. Now, there's different ones, though. Imagine you're driving down the bypass here at EKU and you see those blue lights flashing behind you. What do those mean? Well, first off, time out. There's some cultural things happening here. There's a non-material cultural expectation here that the norm for you is to pull over because there's blue lights behind you, which means one of two things. A, you're in their way and they need to get past you. Or B, you've done something wrong and you need to pull over and suss out what that's about to be. Okay, back into not time out whatever the opposite of timeout is, time in. Yeah. Anyways, with um, sanctions, we have formal sanctions that are things like a police officer could do. So if I'm speeding on the bypass, um, if I'm driving too fast and uh, one of Richmond's finest sees me doing that, they are well within their rights to turn on the blue lights, pull me over and say, dude, you gotta slow down. Here's a ticket, you're gonna pay a fine. Um, you're going to get points on your driver's license, and I'm sure your insurance company is going to be in touch with you in the coming weeks and raise your rates. you got to slow down. You're going to hurt other people if you don't do that. Really cool thing here, too, is because they're doing that, so it protects everyone, right? We are actually even doing a cherished moray here. We protect everyone because if you're driving too fast, you're out of control. It's the same thing if you were driving and drinking. You're dangerous. You shouldn't be doing that, which, by the way, students, if you're drinking ever, you get Uber, you get a ride home, you figure out some other way to get home, walking even, but you never, never, never drive intoxicated. That's very important to me. So remember that if you're at the bar, don't do that. If nothing else, don't do it because it's important to me. Okay. Anyways, it's, it's a it's a more for me. Um, formal sanctions are things that people with specific powers are able to do to get you back in line. That police officer is perfectly um, allowed to give you a ticket. Likewise, let's pretend you did something really horrible, like you killed someone. The police, again, are able to take you into custody, read you very specific rights, and go through the process of having you tried and probably convicted for murder. In fact, there's a whole specific process for how that goes. That's formal sanctioning. You have been formally warned that you broke this specific law, which has often been put into law, and you did this very specific thing wrong, and this is your specific penalty. And this is how we're going to try you for that. That's a formal sanction. Informal sanctions are grandmother's side eye when she looks at you and says, mm -mm. or when your parent, or even I, it's my daughter sometimes, I'm like, hey, nah. And that just means whatever you're doing, you need to chill down. I, I even say that phrase, you need to pull back a couple of notches. That's a common thing I say to my daughter. Like, you need to just, just pull back a couple of notches. It'll be okay. Just pull it back. That's informal. 
What are we going to do if they break the uh, thing, the sanction that we've just given them? Well, nothing. We can't put them in jail for that. We can yell at them more, but it still can be informal sanctions. Maybe it gets to the point that we have to ground them. Ah, now that becomes something like a formal sanction because we're giving a very specific penalty for a very specific violation. It's exciting because all these different things overlap into examples of non-material culture. And if you haven't noticed, they overlap a lot. Isn't that really cool? Like when we're talking about sanctions, we're really talking about mores because there's laws against murdering people, which is one of our mores. We don't kill people, but that's a sanction and it's a formal sanction if you do. It's a very specific penalty. Um, and likewise, we have ways of communicating that information. We have certain values that we value human life. These are all really cool examples. If you're seeing a lot of overlap in non-material culture, that's because it's totally there. These ideas overlap quite a bit. They even overlap too with material culture, like values, for example, links up to religious items. Our communications turn into physical items like stop signs. And our sanctions even become visual things that could be depicted like the side eye or a piece of paper that is your ticket, which is a formal sanction. They overlap is my whole argument here with these non-material ideas. Now, again, if this were a cultural sociology class, this is something that we could explore for weeks because we could get in further and further detail. But we only have so much time in this intro sociology class and we got a lot of other territory to cover. So that is where we'll stop for the time being on non-material culture. Again, remember, culture is a total way of life for a group of people. Material culture are the physical things that we can touch, but there's ideas attached to those. Those get into non-material culture. It's where we end up with things like communication, values, norms, and sanctions. Now, if you have questions, you feel free to email me. If you're not sure if something's a more or a san I'm sorry, a more or a folk way or a formal or informal sanction, you feel free to write me and I'm happy to talk about it. Sometimes they're on kind of gray lines because we really, you know, kind of have to put them into context to figure it out. But I'm happy to work with you. Now, in our next lecture, we're going to start talking about cultural universals and some of the experiences that you might feel when you encounter another culture for the first time. In fact, I'll tell you about my first time in France. Oh, boy. If you got any questions, you feel free to write me. Otherwise, we will talk soon. I'll see you later.